I'm going to now turn it over to Kathy Phillips, uh, who is going to be moderating our panel. And I uh, just want to turn it over here, and then we'll have a chance for an interactive uh, dialogue. So, Thank you so much to the panel and to the group, and especially to Beacon for bringing us all here. I didn't choose nursing. I defaulted because I didn't know what to do. And it's just so exciting to see all of you here with different experiences and different roles that you play in healthcare because healthcare is changing. I mean, the, the, the paradigm of healthcare is significantly different um, today than it was when many of us went into healthcare or even from a few years ago, depending on, on the political winds. But I think one thing that we can all take away to know as nurses that historically and repeatedly over time, nursing, the public trust in nursing is well established. I think for decades in a row in, in surveys, nursing has been listed as the most trusted profession, I believe outside of the year 2001 when it was first responders during, during the 9-11 um, the, uh, crisis. So I'm excited to moderate the panel and we can all leave here with some kind of plan and uh, installation that we're, we're moving forward with our profession and with healthcare and for making really Nebraska a better place to be, uh, to be employed and to provide care for Nebraskans. So I, I just, I really appreciate uh, the opportunity. If I could just ask the panel members, maybe starting with you, Sherry, just to briefly um, describe maybe uh, your role in providing health care for Nebraskans. I know some of you have already introduced yourself, but as far as um, mental health workforce, perhaps what brought you here, and, and, um, and if you could just give us a little bit of information about what brought you here today and what role you play right now in, in mental health and behavioral health workforce, specifically with, with nursing. Sure. I've been a, is that on? Okay, I've been a nurse for 35 years, and I started in medical surgical nursing, and I only lasted about five years. And the rest of the time, I was always the one in the patient's room for the longest time talking to them. So a neurologist told me, hey, Sherry, you need to go into psych. So I did. Um, and I think it's, I've just done a number of different things. And what I love about the Division of Behavioral Health in this role is that um, in many ways, we do set policy, um, but we provide care for the very, um, the most ill and we do it um, probably on a very limited budget with limited resources and do some very, very good things. And it's just rewarding. Every day is a new day. And I work with such talented people, it just keeps me coming back. Uh, I'm Julie Hofek. Uh, for a number of years, I've taught in the graduate program for the University of Nebraska Medical Center. College of Nursing. I've been a psych nurse for, I think, uh, over 40 years. And um, it was one of the, um, when I had my undergraduate nursing experience, I think I had very good teachers. Um, Lucille Joel was one of my um, psych uh, mental health uh, teachers in New Jersey. And um, I was just drawn to the, to the area. It fit me really well. And I think that has been true for uh, all of my life. I, um, or my professional life. I, um, uh, I was also drawn to uh, teaching and research, and um, uh, I think my interest in research came from working for a very short time on a medical surgical floor. It was my first um, uh, job, and I knew I wanted to be a psych nurse, but I ended up on a med surgical floor for a little while. It taught me two things, I think. One was that um, physical health is very important to mental health patients, too, and it, it gave me some grounding in, in uh, uh, mid-surge nursing. And then the second uh, part of that was I was always interested in patients' perceptions of their illness, how they conceptualize their illness, what, how did they use that conceptualization to try to get better, and that's been uh, my uh, research uh, uh, area. Um, I think I'll, I'll stop there and, and turn it over to Dr. Liu. Thank you. Thanks. Is this 
working? Yeah. All right. Yeah, yeah. I'll be brief. Uh, you know, I'm happy to be the MC today, but um, my other role is I'm a child psychiatrist, and I would say that um, this summit, it's just so gratifying for me to see each year the passion and, and the progress, which is something I was talking with Dean Stewart about even uh, six months, a year later. And it began with a pretty passionate lament among many of us that, you know, what are we doing about this? And, and to see so many people coming together around this issue is, is really gratifying. Um, I guess my comment would be that I think we also are at the very leading edge on the national level because uh, this year uh, I've had some conversations. Uh, Dean Stewart mentioned uh, the National Council for Behavioral Health. They have a new medical directors group. And so last year our project was looking at the psychiatric workforce as a whole. And of course there's a, there's a real shortage in 2024, 2025 projections are, are short. So, you know, looking at the, the tremendous role of psychiatric nurses in partnership with many of the other professions is really going to be key. And then I've been gratified to work very closely with Sherry Dawson and her team at the Division of Behavioral Health as we're looking at some of these things about making population health more than just sort of a buzzword that we toss out, you know, or in educational gatherings, but, you know, looking at Project ECHO. Uh, we're, we're keenly interested in how we can do that. And then we also recently have also brought in some folks from a collaborative care, which uh, some of you were able to attend and we really see as a way as we have um, these whole swaths of uh, counties and areas in our rural areas and also parts of our urban areas as well that don't have access and how do we take one person that has specialty expertise and really extend them uh, through care managers and so on. So we really see a tremendous role for psychiatric nurses and it's been a privilege to be part of this, this summit. Afternoon, my, my name is Joe Evans and I am a, a psychologist and I work at the Med Center. I've got kind of two roles. One is uh, I'm a professor at the Monroe Meyer Institute and I headed up the, depart the psychology department there for a number of years. The other role is I'm the clinical director for Be Beacon and I work very closely with Howard, uh, the Behavioral Health Education Center of Nebraska. Um, I guess I've been in the field now for over 40 years and uh, showing my age with my graying hair here. Um, but um, one of the, one of the uh, most gratifying things that we're doing, I think in terms of workforce development, is looking at, at what, how do we get access to folks out there in, in the communities. And, and uh, one of the things that we've, uh, we've discovered over the years is that uh, uh, we've had some stagnant growth, for example, in, in, in uh, uh, psychiatry, psychology. Psychiatric nursing from 2000, 10 to 2016 actually increased by 45 percent and we are actually above the national average in terms of the number of, of uh, psych nurse practitioners uh, as a compared to a national uh, sample of per hundred thousand and I, I think a lot of that is due to folks like uh, Dr. Terry Matthews, Dr. Julie Hofek, uh, Michael Rice when he was here uh, and looking at expanding the role of, of uh, psychiatric nursing beyond specialty care and actually into the community. And we'll talk a little bit later on about uh, integrating behavioral health care into primary care where we think some of the action is going to be in the future. So those are kind of my backgrounds. We've been, we've been putting together a, a, a integrated care program now for placing of, of psychologists and counselors and social workers and MFTs uh, and some psychiatric nurses into uh, the uh, primary care field, and we've got 42 clinics now across the state that actually are doing that in primary care. So we, we feel really good about that, and, but we've got an awful long way to go. There's 179 primary care practices outside of Omaha and Lincoln in, in our state, and we're in maybe 24 of those. So we're maybe 15%, but we, our goal is, before I ride off into the sunset, is to uh, get uh, more practitioners out there into some of our rural areas. Um, I'm Tina Vest. I'm a psychiatric nurse practitioner in private practice in Lincoln, Nebraska. I also have a satellite office in Beatrice. I've been a psychiatric nurse for 22 years, 17 of those as a nurse practitioner. Um, I've learned a lot over the last couple of months in my little ivory tower um, aesthetically pleasing private practice that I'm going to have to do something <laughs> different and even today with Joe. Um, I went into my own business I think this is really relevant, speaking of outreach and things like that. I grew up with entrepreneurs. My, my parents were not educated. My father was an eighth grade dropout, my mother 10th grade, but they started their own businesses and paved their own way. The reason I think that's important is they recognized either 
They agreed to either wed me off or pay for college. I chose college, which was the best decision ever. Um, however, I think, you know, in conjunction with now that we have independent practice, which is a huge accomplishment in the state, um, thinking beyond the box of just independent practice and we're just churning through patients day by day, um, this collaborative care model um, totally I'm totally buying into it, so I'm very anxious to talk about it, so thank you. Thank you to the panel members. So Sherry, you brought forth some, some points responding to trends and um, using what we have. For example, you mentioned infrastructure, practice, education, support, and partners. And earlier this morning, we talked a lot about models of education, um, facilitating um, you know, a dedicated education unit as far as, an, a very, um, as far as I'm concerned, a very creative way to address education, recruiting, and, and retention in the workforce. So I'd, I'd like to ask the panel to consider what are one or two of the most salient trends that you believe affect psych nursing practice or education? Because the focus of this summit is looking at both practice and education um, issues. And if I, if I might choose to start with you, Joe, because I do know that you have um, specific information to share with the group about integrated um, care models, and then if we could have any of the other panel members chime in as far as uh, your thoughts on, on the trends that do affect nursing practice or education. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, now I gotta admit, uh, Kathy and I don't, didn't know each other till about a few minutes ago, but her mother was my next door neighbor when I was growing up, and her, her father was my eighth grade baseball and football coach. <laughs> so, Small world. Yeah. Um, Integrated care is, is kind of the, the thing that uh, has really captured my heart and we're really pushing in that direction. And there are several models of integrated care, but they, they kind of boil down into two major ones. One of them is the collaborative care model or AIMS model that was just uh, uh, presented here in Omaha. Uh, Dr. Anna Ratzliff came out from uh, the University of Washington. And she, this is her second visit to us here. Um, talking about collaborative care, and uh, the American Psychiatric Association is now contracted to have like 3,500 psychiatrists trained in this area. Um, frankly, we just don't have enough psychiatrists in, in the state. Um, we've had an increase of a net gain of two over the past five years. So, uh, needless to say, that's uh, that's not exactly keeping up with the trends. So, we're hoping that you know, I mean, Howard has been excellent at at bringing people back into the state from like Michigan and the places around the country. So uh, if without him, we probably would have had a net loss. So <laughs> the, uh, uh, he just brought three people back from the, in the past, uh, past year. Um, we believe that they're, they're, the, the, psych, the collaborative care model is, is something that where we have actually like a case manager or a depression manager that's working in the practice and then screens and then makes referral out for uh, consultation back to the, the primary care physician. And the, the, that particular model has had some very, very positive uh, uh, evaluative uh, results uh, and uh, has, uh, there's, there's a lot of publications on this uh, area as well. And it's very exciting because what it means is essentially we're able to do much more population-based uh, services for, for our folks. The other model is the one that we're probably more involved with, but there's really a very, uh, I think, great opportunity for overlap between these programs. This is called the, the primary care behavioral health or primary care mental health model. And in that model, we, have, we actually place an individual in the practice with the idea that we still can have a backup of, of telehealth from, from our, our uh, uh, colleagues. So in terms of the, 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 the way that we train nurses in this area as, uh, in terms of education and some of the challenges are, uh, there are different models that we can even do that for, uh, like for example, Bridget, who spoke this morning, uh, spends uh, six days uh, a month going to Columbus, Nebraska, where she basically is, is a provider there. 
um, but all the billing and, and everything comes through the medical center. We have Tina, uh, who uh, is in private practice and does all this through her practice. Uh, we also have folks who actually are out uh, and they're, they're partners in the practice, and then some folks who actually receive a percentage, like may, maybe get the 60 or 70 percent of the, whatever revenue generated. But the beauty of the, at the integrated care model is that the, the show rate uh, is anywhere from 80 to 90 percent uh, versus when a physician or a, a nurse refers somebody to behavioral health practice outside of the, the area. Uh, it goes down to 25 percent for adults and 40 percent for kids. So needless to say, we're not getting, we're, we're and part of that stigma, but if you have a person embedded in the program, there's no reason to know that uh, I'm going in to see my psychiatric nurse practitioner or my, or my physician, uh, so is it medical or is it, is it behavioral? And the, the whole concept of primary, the, the uh, uh, medical home model where basically we know that, for example, family medicine practitioners miss 50% of depression in, in their patients. And we know that 20% of people coming into the, to the doctor's office have behavioral health or mental health problems. How do we reach those folks? How do we identify them more er, uh, earlier? And at the same time, uh, provide them with the good services. And then for the most severe folks, then we do have to have specialty care. And, and uh, that's where I, I think with some of our, our shrinking uh, population of uh, specialists that we need to, not shrinking, but at least stagnant, we need to be able to kind of screen those out and uh, work with those on the primary care model before we move them up to the, uh, to the specialty care level. So uh, the, the field is changing, and I think we've, we've really can, can see that there are some awful lot of opportunities for our, our psychiatric nurse colleagues, and we have a grant from the, one of the ones that uh, Dr. Stewart mentioned this morning, Behavioral Health Workforce Education and Training Grant, and we're training uh, clinical psychologists, uh, MA level counselors and, and behavior analysts and psychiatric nurses. So we have four students that uh, are, we're supporting this year uh, in the psychiatric nurse program, two in Lincoln uh, and uh, one in inner city Nebraska, or inner city Omaha, and one here at the university. So uh, that's just the, this is just the beginning. And we think we can, we can uh, really expand that uh, area and, and support uh, some, some internships and training uh, with some of our, our federal funding as well. Thank you, Joe. That was very interesting. So any of the other um, panel members from your specific area of expertise and your perspective um, in healthcare, what are the most salient trends that you see um, that affect psychiatric nurse practice or education, or both? Turning this microphone on, but... Uh, <laughs> uh, so I would say that um, this is a real opportunity on several things, and I want to echo a little bit of what was said earlier. So uh, Sherry mentioned in her workforce presentation data that uh, we certainly need, as Joe is illustrating, the need to cover the 90% that are going to be hit by primary care, right, you know, of individuals. But there's always going to be this need of 5 to 10% of the specialty care. And so we've actually partnered uh, with, uh, with the regional center and also the corrections to train providers. And I wonder if Julie can also comment a little bit on that. But uh, to train, including nursing students uh, that want to uh, rotate and spend some dedicated time because we don't think it's going to be by accident that we're going to have the future workforce of the regional center or uh, any of the correctional centers. We really need to deliberately send people there. And actually, if you talk to those students, they tend to love those rotations because they get a lot of responsibility, a lot of independence with supervision, and just really some transformative experiences. So I would just like to highlight that if you are a nursing educator and you've got uh, a lack of preceptorships, as we keep hearing about, you know, this is a one place that we can focus, and we do have some funds to support that. So certainly contact any of us at the Beacon team. You can probably also contact Sherry's team as well and, and any of the nursing programs, but I think that's one opportunity. At a national level, uh, I think that the opioid crisis is going to probably define our decade in terms of truly breaking the lid off of 
you know, all attempts to stifle mental and behavioral health as a legitimate issue. So I think it has impacted every community. It's out of control. And now you, you read the fentanyl data that, you know, it's not just, uh, you know, what, what's being prescribed, it's what's on the street. And, and, and uh, it's a major thing. I also see a big gap, which is, you know, why it's so exciting that Sherry's team led this STR grant in the providers providing a med-assisted treatment, MAT. Uh, and, you know, looking at the national data, I think one in four are finding easy access to MAT prescriber. I think this could be the very moment for every psychiatric nurse practitioner to step up on this, you know, and because I, I would say I have, I've, I've seen the MD community falter a bit on here. They're, they're really not stepping up to the plate. When we talk to our primary care partners, many of them are reluctant because they, they're a little bit, uh, I think, concerned whether they have the expertise and there's a bit of stigma about this, this work. <clears throat> but whoever takes this on, I think, is really going to define this next decade as the relevant provider here, you know, and so that the training isn't that long, but we certainly need to support it. And we did it an MAT summit in partnership with uh, DBH and SAMHSA and ATTC. You know, certainly there's going to be additional training opportunities. We want to support people through Project ECHO once they pick up that expertise and have some challenging patients. But, you know, I would love to see, and I believe there's been a push from APNA National as well, that, that this can really be an area that we can fill that gap because it's huge and, and every day it's looming. I'll, I'll follow up on the uh, the, the uh, correctional and Lincoln regional experiences, uh, or the uh, I should say regional center experiences. Um, uh, in the graduate program at the university, we have uh, in psych mental health nursing, we have tried to keep students in their you know regional area. It makes a lot of sense because. Uh, the distances are great, um, and uh, 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 people's commitments in their lives are, um, uh, w w school is, is one of the uh, many roles that they have, student is one of the many roles that they have. Um, but we have been uh, talking uh, with uh, um, people in the Department of Health and Human Services and Corrections about trying to make more um, uh, structured rotations for students in corrections and the regional center for those students who could and have an interest in, you know, in, in those areas. And so I think that this is going to be a really great addition to um, our clinical uh, experiences and um, also give students more of the, um, you know, the, uh, the clinical uh, patient uh, experiences that will help them in their career. So I'm really, um, really happy that we are uh, working on that. I think that the other um, areas that Howard mentioned, the you know the um, medication-assisted treatment, is something that is um, really uh, uh, very important in the curriculum too, and we're looking for ways to. Uh, encourage both our graduates to do that and getting our students more interested in um, uh, looking at um, substance use, um, misuse, um, substance abuse um, uh, treatment. We do cover it in the curriculum, but probably not as extensively given the, um, uh, the number of patients that you see with some kind of um, uh, co um, comorbid or additional uh, diagnoses. Um, I think uh, the other area that I wanted to um, talk about as a trend in uh, nursing practice, and it, it, it would support all of the areas that we've talked about, collaborative care, uh, interdisciplinary care, um, uh, evidence-based treatment, and that is the trend of moving away from the master's degree as the you know, professional practice degree to the doctor of nursing practice. Um, uh, Terry had mentioned that we have decided to keep the master's degree you know, in our curriculum for at least the near future. And I think Creighton has moved to a, a, a doctor of nursing practice degree as their, as their uh, entry into advanced practice. But um, when you look at the, um, the uh, outcomes for the DNP, it has a really um, great potential for um, bringing nursing practice to a very evidence-based level, um, being more um, proactive in terms of systems leadership change, 
being more um, aware of the cost effectiveness and being able to look at the economic um, impact of whatever uh, uh, programs uh, we would like to you know, move into the clinical area. I think it has both relevance for um, people in independent practice, for example, um, you know, people who start their own business, as well as um, uh, nursing care in more uh, larger organizations. So I, I think it's, um, uh, it's, uh, it, it has arrived maybe not as soon as organized nursing would have wanted it to be. I think you know, 2015 was the time that all master's programs were going to uh, you know, uh, transition to the DNP. Um, but um, uh, uh, but it, it's, it's coming along. So I, I think that's a, 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 you know, a, a really um, emerging and significant trend uh, in nursing education. I'd like to also say that um, one of the really great opportunities would be to combine um, um, practitioners who have that, doc that professional doctorate with people who are more interested in uh, basic research, the PhD practicing nurse, um, to, you know, to use their expertise, their specific clinical and um, research methodology knowledge to really um, uh, do um, more um, high-quality uh, high and useful research for uh, the, not only for our profession, but uh, you know, for healthcare as, as a whole. So I think, I think I'll, I'll stop there and, and um, <coughs> ask for any comments from the panel. I have to turn this. Oh, um, I would love to go back to school. I don't have time. Um, I, it's, a, it's quite a dilemma because we have the shortage and we have this influx of patients and then you have the master's prepared nurses and when do they go back or how do they do that? And um, it's, I, I grapple with it quite a bit. I, I, I see there's a lot of value to it, obviously. Um, and then how do you do that is, is the challenge. Um, I wanted to kind of touch on something that Dr. Stewart mentioned earlier about kind of um, narrowing the gap between education and clinically, like what's actually happening clinically versus, you know, re you know educationally and perhaps at state and legislative levels. Um, and I, I struggle with that too. I've been on the executive board for Nebraska Nurse Practitioners and volunteer you know, done some legislative things in the past, but how do we, that's what I struggle with, especially on a day-to-day -day basis, working, um, raising a family, those sort of things. I'm, I'm certainly not complaining, but I think there still is a disconnect with that, and there could perhaps be further research, you know, progress to be made if we narrow that gap more. Yeah, yeah. Um. Uh, and I, and I, uh, uh, I echo that. Um, Terry had asked me to mention uh, another grant that the uh, College of Nursing uh, has, and that is um, uh, in addition to Joe's grant, we have a grant that is um, really um, focusing on uh, rural um, students in the rural area and trying to give them an immersive experience in the clinical um, uh, in area where they would stay for a, a period of time. And it has a stipend with it, so it would free students up a little bit more to, um, you know, to go full time uh, on their education. But one of the, um, uh, it has an advisory panel, and so that might be one of the ways that we could, you know, have more of a match with um, what's happening in the clinical area for, you know, what the uh, educators, um, you know, uh, uh, see. And so there's an advisory panel. Uh, that um, uh, will be uh, uh, started. And then the other component of that is to provide more um, as, uh, um, continuing education uh, for being a preceptor, so a more um, organized um, uh, way that um, people who want to be preceptors at the graduate level for, for um, APRN students uh, can um, um, you know, have a, a access to more resources uh, through this grant. I wasn't able to be in the session about uh, establishing preceptorships, but I can speak from personal experience. I have an expectation with an employer about billable hours and patient satisfaction um, and outcome measures and 
taking on students to precept from the standpoint of how that affects your flow and what your employer expects of you. And I'm seeing lots of nodding heads mm -hmm. here. That, that is something where I, I personally see somewhat of a disconnect between educational preparation and the clinical realities of, uh, of what um, practitioners, regardless of their discipline, whether they're physicians, nurse practitioners, PAs, et cetera, uh, what's expected of them in, in the workplace from a productivity standpoint. So that, that's more um, into the economics, um, but it, but certainly a very real issue that affects the workforce and practice and education. I'm curious, um, Sherry, because the, the focus has been more on advanced practice, is there anything else that you would like to highlight as far as trends or initiatives that you see um, that can help with the psych workforce for the RN population in Nebraska for, for needing a well-prepared RN workforce for psychiatric care? Well, I think one of the great things, is that on? Okay, good. Um, one of the great things is uh, in Nebraska, there's really a lot of opportunity and going on in terms of um, mental health, psychiatric um, opportunities. And I think what we don't always do, and I, when Dr. Stewart was going through some of the maps of Nebraska, um, she had one that had a, like the drug-free community grants and talking about we only had four. And we also have grants at the state level um, on suicide prevention, and we also have um, for underage drinking, and then we have prevention coalitions. And I just think what it, what it helps connect is there's a lot of good things out there in Nebraska, and somehow being able to take, especially for those undergrads, if people in this room that are teaching and educating and doing the clinical practice, if we don't know what those resources are or what those opportunities are, it's, it's hard even amongst our specialty, right, to get people where they need to go, um, much less to look at the bigger, you know, RN population and, and ha um, how to do that. So beginning to think about what does that look like for even maximizing resources? I know at the Lincoln Regional Center, we have lots of students and they're kind of here and there and um, you know, trying to have nurses and preceptors and so forth, but we're gonna have to figure that out on how to really maximize um, the limited resources that we do to continue to bring people um, in. And I think any time anybody in this room does any kind of um, talk at church or wherever you are, just normalizing the conversation about mental illness and substance use disorder will get us so far. Opioids is on the scene right now, but you can talk about opioids and also talk about mental illness. You can talk about opioids and you can talk about alcohol, still the number one issue um, in Nebraska, um, so is nicotine dependence. And so beginning to just have some of those conversations so it becomes part of healthcare um, for RNs. Can I Thank add a, you. A, I want to sort of trailing on that. Um, because we talk about resources and, and things like that, and we want to do all these things. And one thing that I, I talked, I had a really nice little group earlier. We had a lot of interaction, it was nice. Um, I think if we have more training, perhaps, or discussions within programs about the business aspect of healthcare, because we are bombarded with that the day we step out into mm -hmm. occupations. And the more educated we are about that, um, perhaps we can become more business savvy. That helps us legislatively, uh, budget-wise. I think it was helpful having Senator Vargas here as well, um, because it's hard to know what we need, uh, what we want, how do we pay for it if we have no idea what, you know, entities are reimbursing. Uh, there's assumptions that Medicaid is a, a, a poor payer, and, it, and it's not. <laughs> um, so. I guess I want to emphasize that I, I think there's a disconnect there still with business training um, and education, especially uh, at the advanced level especially. Um, and then if you could free up those resources, perhaps advanced practice providers are maybe generating more revenue, then they can perhaps participate more in these projects. That makes sense and help further the profession. If I'm making sense with that, they can kind of pay it forward they'll be able to do that. Mm -hmm. 
Very good points. Thank you, Tina. I think we're running out of time. Do we have time for questions to the panel or? One or two questions. One or two questions for the panel from the group. Hi, I'm Anita Leonard. Um, I work at the Mental Health Crisis Center in Lincoln. We're a small agency. We're a county agency. We get funding from all over. But we would love to do some grants and things like that. But being a small agency, that's really tough sometimes. I guess I'm going to throw out a challenge that I think as, as a state, we have a lot of resources, but we're very one resource here, one resource there, one resource there. And maybe there's a way we could partner with BHECN to put those resources out there and say, hey, we're all looking at this grant. Who would like to join us? Um, make it so that smaller agencies, not just myself, there's a lot of agencies here all over this state that would probably benefit from some grants in some ways of making things better for our clients if we had the resources from other places. I think it's a great comment. Uh, I'm going to say that you have accomplished the first step by showing up today and asking that question because I, I would say that not just Beacon, but many of us struggle with always working with the same 10 people. So, you know, it's. Hey, whatever, national, local, whatever it is, you know, I know this person, we'll pull them in on this grant. And part of the whole purpose of this summit is to get to know other people. And I think whether it's an idea like integrated behavioral health, where it doesn't have to be in a whole FTE, it could be 10% time that you're, for example, serving as a psychiatric consultant or something like that, or one of these training grants where we're always looking for partners. We don't always know who they are. So... So maybe, Nick, as we're thinking about this too, Nick's done a great job helping to, to, to pull this together along with the Planning Coalition too, is, is really having a directory and a bit of a description about you know, who's here today and uh, you know, how we can, what kind of opportunities might be interested in the future. I think that's how we can action orient some of uh, Dr. Stewart's recommendations as well, but I think it's a great suggestion. Thank you, I think it is too. Any other questions for the panel? We will wrap up the panel session. I want to thank you all for your time and to the uh, panel for their, their information. Just want to leave you with one last thought because most of us here are in nursing for a reason and going back to probably something from Dr. Stewart's um, textbook when I was in Mary Coon Connell's class. We can all um, share our therapeutic use of self. Thank you.